Jeff Cutler is going to give us a talk on the Canadian Lake Source. So whether you're taking the tour or not, please do stick around and hear what he has to say so we can learn something about the Lake Source. So give us a few minutes and we'll be ready. Or taking the tour. Okay. Uh, Jeff Cutler from the Canadian Lake Source is going to give us a, a brief overview and, and uh, I guess a background on uh, what's happening and what's going to happen. Jeff, it's all yours. Thanks, Craig. Um, this was a good opportunity to actually talk a little bit about what the light source is because a number of you are going to take a tour in a few minutes, so I can give you a little bit of an insight on what the light source is, what some of the opportunities are, and how the bloody thing works because it's just a bunch of uh, steel pipes and electric wires you see running around. Uh, here's a picture of this light source itself. Um, this is the building you'll arrive in a few minutes. We're sitting in the best parole, which is right back there. So you got the South Saskatchewan River, the university back here. Here's the, the ball prairie out here. You can watch your dog run away for three days out here. Uh, so it gives you a bit of a sense of where we are in the community. So let's see if we can actually make this thing. Oh. Give you a little history lesson. I think this is always kind of useful to actually give you a little sense of history. Um, the University of Saskatchewan it was founded about 100 years ago in 1909. The, the, actually, the city of Saskatoon's in their centennial year this year. Um, the University of Sa uh, Saskatchewan is located in Saskatoon. And one thing I'm going to do at the end, I'm actually going to explain to you why the University of Saskatchewan is actually in Saskatoon. It's actually very kind of an interesting little story um, right at the very end of my talk. But let's see here if we can actually make this thing. I pointed at that or pointed at that. Here's just a picture from the building from 1910 as they built the college building. This is one of the main campuses on, on one of the main buildings on campus. Um, we just reopened this again after uh, significant renovations. Um, but you can sort of see from 1910, you sort of see the horse pulled carts, all the very old technology. Um, next slide. Let's see the one work. 1915, a couple years later, as we started growing, a lot of the things this university is very well known for is agricultural research. Uh, here's the experimental farm barn. If you drive on campus, you can actually see um, uh, it on campus. Here's some of the student residences, which is a bit more like a farm barn as well. But you have a bit of a sense of what is actually on the university campus. Next slide. Some of the early history research here. Who, who here works on Kyoto? I don't know. But here's some early Kyoto research. Uh, straw gas fuels, 1911. I don't know if I necessarily want to drive in that vehicle with that above my head. I think this is interesting because this is alternative fossil fuels. I think it's really biodiesel. Um, <laughs> of course, pulling a car, which I think is kind of an interesting approach in 1934 with the price of gas nowadays. We may have to go back to that fairly soon. Um, but just some interesting uh, photos, some history. Next slide, please. Then you can sort of, there's a lot of materials research that's always been done here. Dr. Thorvaldson, who the chemistry department is named after at the University of Saskatchewan, was famous for his research in the areas of cement. Uh, this is the Victoria Bridge, which they're now going to have to uh, rebuild, I assume, here. It's just over here. It's closed to car traffic because of all the corrosion problems associated with it. Um, so it's from 19, this is about 1913. So this just gives you uh, a few more little pictures of the campus. Next picture. But why is the synchrotron here? One of the things that this university was very famous for is the development of cobalt-60 radiation therapy. And this sort of leads into why the synchrotron is actually in Saskatoon, because the question is always coming, why the heck would you build a $180 million lab in the middle of the prairie? Why would you even want to go down that road? But here's some of the early radiation beam therapy uh, from about 1951 by Dr. Johns. Uh, next slide. But the real reason the lab is here is there was a nuclear physics program here from about 1960s, uh, even sooner than that, 1950s, in which they did um, a lot of fundamental nuclear physics research where they took electrons, slammed them into materials to see what a lot of the fundamental nuclear processes were. And one of the main components that led to the facility being here is this linear accelerator, this LINAC. This LINAC is about 1964. That's Dr. Leon Katzer, uh, who was the founder of the uh, Saskatchewan Accelerator Laboratory. We're actually still using this LINAC. This LINAC is actually our source of electrons. So it's like the old 60s Chevy and you're driving, you smack it with a hammer and it keeps working. But this old LINAC is actually our source of electrons for the storage room. Go to the next slide. Now we're going to take a, a step forward of what does this have to do with that? And what I want to talk to you a little bit a few minutes about is that this is a real big version of that. In that you're using light, you're shining on the materials, that light tells you something about those materials. In this particular case, in colorimetry, you're looking at, say, the color permanganate solution if you're an undergraduate, and you're looking at various electronic transitions lead to that color. 
While here, we're taking very powerful x-rays. We're using those very powerful x-rays. Instead of looking at, say, a valence band transitions, we're now looking at transitions from very tightly bound electrons to other types of shells. And there was a good talk this afternoon where they sort of talked about, you know, gold. You're looking at all these d orbitals. You're looking at taking electrons from, say, a, a 2p level, and you're calculating d levels and looking at these various electronic transitions using these x-rays. So if we can get the next slide. So what does light let you do? Light lets you see things, and that's what we're doing at the synchrotron. We're using light to see, let you see things. So light comes to the windows, the lights are on the roof here, that light bounces off my body, and whoever had the tour yesterday will, will have heard the same thing, and they can just actually give this little part of the talk. But that light goes back to your eyes, and you learn things about me. You make inferences about me, how the light interacts with me. You see I'm a frumpy scientist, I have absolutely no fashion sense whatsoever, and you learn, you're learn learning things about me. So you can, you can understand me. But if you take different colors of light, for example, say, just before I move on, here's a picture of the hands from the roof of the Sistine Chapel, very beautifully done. But now if you take different colors of light, x-rays, now you can shine through things. Actually, right the next the button again. Um, you can actually see through, see through things. And this is actually one of the first x-ray images taken by Rankin about over 100 years ago of his wife's hand. Uh, you can see now, instead of having this different color of light, now you can start seeing the bone structure in here. You can start seeing the individual bones. You can start seeing the ring on her hand. Um, with more sophisticated techniques now, you can start looking at the soft tissue in there, the cartilage, all the different things that make up this hand. So having different colors of light lets you start seeing different things. Next slide. So here's the light source here. Um, this is where you're going to go in a few minutes. This picture's a little bit different now because we're in the midst of construction out the front. Here's the inside of the light source where we're actually generating the light back here. This is actually a synchrotron hidden behind these concrete walls. There's various beam lines. I'm going to talk in a second here about how does a synchrotron actually work and how does it actually generate that light to actually look at, let you look at new materials. But this will be effectively what you see when you come into the facility and we'll walk our way around. There's actually offices along this back wall now, um, which we just opened up about a week ago. So next slide. Here's just gives you a little sense on the campus. Here's the, here's the Canadian light source here, the synchrotron here. Here's, the, like I said before, the university back here. This is actually an interesting environment to actually do research. And this is actually, I'll point my finger at all the industrial guys sitting in the room because this is actually a very powerful opportunity here. Because we're one of the few university campuses in which we have all the major teaching colleges, along with synchrotron, along with a very successful innovation park. So we have engineering, we have chemistry, we have physics, we have the arts and sciences along with having things like uh, veterinary school, medical school, we have law, we have the whole nine yards, but you also get right into the medical research. You've got a plant, the NRC has a research facility here, the Ag Canada has a research center, along with um, vaccine infectious disease organizations. So there's lots of different things here, which is really kind of a unique opportunity because the synchrotron, coupled with all these, one of my colleagues came to the University of Saskatchewan from the University of Chicago, and now he's a Canadian research chair at the university. And one comment was, and I thought this was an interesting comment, the University of Saskatchewan has an opportunity to be the Mayo Clinic, or the, excuse me, the Silicon Valley for medical research, was his comment. But you can stick anything in there. You can put, has the opportunity to become the Silicon Valley of catalysis research. Because you have all this infrastructure here. You have world-class researchers in chemical engineering, along with a synchrotron which no other university in Canada has sitting on their, in their back door. So guys like A.J. Goliath who's floating somewhere around this room, um, right there, wow, it's in the front row, um, have a real opportunity to get that, new, do research that nobody else can do. They can start doing in situ analysis, they can start looking at new fundamental materials. If, if you're doing puddle metallurgy or you're trying to develop new catalysts or whatever the case may be, now you've got unbelievably <coughs> sophisticated now analytical tools because that was actually one of the questions. I was at a conference last week in Calgary. I'm a lubrication engineer, that's really my research. And there was a panel discussion in one of the sessions I was in. And my question was to them, was where do they see the role of advanced analytical techniques fitting into these research programs? Every single one of those people in that, in that panel said they need access to these advanced analytical tools. The reason being is that most, a lot of lab techniques now have given you potentially as much information as you possibly can get with them and there's still information they don't know. And it's not until you have access to a synchrotron or you have access to some of these newer tools that you can start answering these questions. We've done some work with companies like the FASCO and other groups like that where we've been able to give them information they've been able not to get any other way without having to come use a light source. Next slide. 
have to show all our funding partners. This is a unique collaboration among different agencies, uh, along with the federal government up here. You've actually got, got the University of Western Ontario, University of Alberta involved, along with the province of Ontario, province of Alberta. So this is one of the few projects where you'll see other provinces putting money into that project. We're talking British Columbia right now about opportunities to contribute as well. I like right down the industry. Oregon, Lincoln, has put money into the project. The city of Saskatoon even put money into the project. So when you're going back to the airport, if you ask a cab driver about the synchrotron and what it does, he'll probably tell you. Um, but it was a comment about people in Swift Current knowing about what the synchrotron was. And this is exactly the same kind of example where everybody seems to have some sense of what's going on. Next. Here we are in Saskatoon. I'll get through these fairly quickly because everybody has to run down and get to the bus in a few minutes. Um, here's Saskatoon here. Here's the other synchrotrons kind of distributed around the world. There's a number in the U.S. quite often associated with Department of Energy Laboratories. Um, and so access sometimes can be a bit of a question because we're on the university campus, there's a, it's a little bit less of an issue. I've got a colleague of mine from Toronto who still can't get into Brookhaven National Labs because his name is the same as somebody on the FBI's most wanted list. So they actually won't let him on site. Um, so you can imagine uh, occasionally there's some challenges. There's a number of facilities in Europe. Uh, the Swiss light source is floating around in here. You've got a number of other facilities around uh, in Europe. Australia's in the midst of building a facility. There's quite a number of Japan. Japan's always had a huge number. Um, they seem to have about half the world's synchrotrons actually in various size, shapes, and forms. Uh, along with even India, Brazil, um, Russia have a, have a number of facilities as well. Next. Talked about synchrotron, what is synchrotron? How is it like produced? Um, you can go ahead and take the, the gluten. We take electrons, we take them very, very close to the speed of light. They're relativistic at that point. When those electrons are caused to be bent by a magnetic field, they radiate. And what they radiate is they radiate a continuum of radiation. So you get generate infrared, you generate visible, you generate ultraviolet, soft, and hard x-rays. So as a researcher, now instead of having a line source where you're doing, say, have a copper K-alpha source, we're doing powder diffraction, or you've got aluminum K-alpha source because you're doing photo emission, now you've got a tunable source. Now you can walk in the door and say, I need 10 kilovolt photons to do this particular experiment, or I need, I need 1,000 EV or I need 5 EV to do, do my experiments. Now you've got a very bright continuum source so you can start picking the different things you actually have. Next slide. So this is a little bit of a cartoon of what the synchrotron looks like. It's just a big ring. Electrons actually whiz around. And every time electrons are, say, bent by the, this type of bending magnet, you generate light. Okay, you hit the button real quick. So you get these, these cones of radiation actually coming off where you can actually put a beam line and actually build experiments. One of the other tricks we can play, instead of just bending the electrons once, we can put a magnetic structure in there and we can wiggle the beam back and forth really quickly. And what we get is constructive destructive interference patterns or we can enhance the intensity of the light so we get even more brilliant sort of uh, intensity radiation. Um, just hit it real quick. So then you get even a brighter source. So it just kind of happily goes around in a circle. It's actually interesting because I was thinking when um, Professor White was talking about his son having a band called Cat uh, Catalyst, maybe start thinking about my son's soccer team. Because a couple years ago, they, they actually named his soccer team the Holliston Synchrotrons. And I tried to ask them, well, why'd you name it after the synchrotron? And they said, well, because the kids are full of energy, they just go. And I thought it was because they ran around in circles. But that's, that's beside the point. Um, so this gives you a bit of an idea of how bright this is. This source is billions of times brighter than anything you'll have in your lab. And what that lets you do is you can focus the beam now, you can start pushing down detection limits, you can start doing all sorts of kind of fundamental things you never thought you could do before. Here's just kind of a, a little bit of a kind of spectrum you might get from a lab source um, where you've got spikes of radiation, but you can effectively just have a bit of a continuum. Here's a synchrotron, potentially a bending magnet of a synchrotron. Right now, we're at about six or seven orders of magnitude, increasing intensity. Now, if you start sticking this on these insertion devices, uh, other types of insertion devices, you can get up to about 10 to the 20th. You get huge amounts more of intensity to start doing some of these experiments. Here's a little look inside the synchrotron. Unfortunately, because we're in operation right now, you won't actually get to see a lot of inside behind the concrete walls. But here's our linear accelerator. I talked about it from the 1960s. This is our source of electrons. The electrons come out here about 250 MeV, about 99.9995 the speed of light. They go from this linear accelerator into this first uh, inner ring, which is uh, it's called a booster ring. It sort of gives the electrons a kick in the pants because they're not going fast enough yet. You'll hear it referred to as the Canadian light source as a 2.9 GeV synchrotron. Uh, so that refers to the energy electrons in the ring. 
So they come from this 250 MeV LINAC, they go into this, this accelerator, they accelerate up to 2.9 GeV, and then they go into this outer ring, and that's the, that's the ring that actually generates the light. So we can have a number of different, the electrons just have to whiz around here, and every time they bend, they give off light. We can put about 25 to 30 beam lines in here, depending on how we sort of rack and stack them. But we can have about 25 to 30 different beam lines in here, and no two will probably be the same. So that's the kind of neat thing, is that you can walk into a, a synchrotron facility, and you might find one beam line that's really optimized to do hard x-ray work, to say, look at gold or molybdenum, different materials like that. And you can go to another beam line in the facility, which is optimized to look at carbon. And you go to a third beam line, which is optimized for the far IR. So now you can kind of come and pick your different wavelengths. So as you sort of can drift around the facility, you can actually interact, and you can use these different techniques. But where this, the real power comes from is not the fact that you've got all these bright light sources too, is that if you walk in there in any given day, you'll have AJ sitting there who's the chemical engineer in one corner, and you'll have somebody else who's a medical doctor in another corner, somebody who's in physics over here, and chemistry over there, maybe somebody in geology in another department. It gives you an opportunity to interact with people you never even thought you'd ever interact with before. So it ends up being a bit of an enabling technology that way. I've taken a number of industrial researchers to various synchrotrons, and they've walked in the door with one idea, I'm gonna look at this, and they walk with the idea with 10 new ideas because they've had an opportunity to have a beer with the guy from chemical engineering, played around of golf with the guy out of physics, so they get a bit of a sense of some other opportunities. So it ends up being a bit of an enabling technology, it allows people to come together and interact in kind of new and unique and different ways. Because science today cannot be done in a black box. You look at more and more science, starts pulling people from so many different areas now to start looking at doing, uh, doing calculations and doing formulations and doing this and doing that. You get the people in the lab doing, um, making reactors. You have to bring all these different groups that may have never traditionally ever taught into the same facility and having the opportunity to interact. Here's just a, bit of a, a couple of pictures inside the facility. Here's just a look at the beam lines we're actually building here. We have, right now we're finishing, commissioning on our first suite of beam lines, which is a, a series of seven beam lines ranging from very hard x-rays, which go up to about 40 kilovolts, down to the mid to far IR. Uh, so we have a broad spectrum of different wavelengths that people can actually probe using the synchrotron. Um, the infrared's kind of an interesting one because you, we have a microscope on there like you might find a lot of labs. But because the synchrotron is very collimated and has a lot of intensity, you can actually go down to the, um, the effect of the diffraction limit in the infrared. So instead of looking at things 50, 100 microns in size, you would have an effect to be able to five microns in spatial resolution. Synchrotron also generates huge amounts of far IR, so it's really kind of neat for looking at, say, metal species bond, uh, bond stretches in the infrared that you might not be able to probe other ways. We're set up in a unique way, and Jeff, uh, Dr. Warner over there at the corner is giving a talk right after lunch tomorrow. Um, so I'd suggest people try to attend, um, where we have set aside a certain amount of time available for first come, first serve. Most of these facilities are peer-reviewed academic research um, for publishing purposes. We do have a mechanism in place where we can, you know, control the intellectual property, because I came up on this, big, this panel sitting here talking about intellectual property issues and uh, where the universities fit into all these. We have actually set up a mechanism in which we can make the IP issues, you know, effectively clean cut and clear and somebody comes in and pays full cost recovery, they walk up the door and own all the intellectual property, we have nothing to do with it. So um, we also set aside a certain amount of time so people can pay and sort of skip those peer review processes. You can almost, you can go touch on almost every area, here's advanced materials, catalysis and hide in here somewhere, but you can get into life and health and life sciences, certain sciences, so there's lots of different areas. My area is oil tribology, which is in one of the areas where I, there's been huge inroads made because of synchrotron. Um, ESSO did a lot of work in tribology with the University of Western Ontario for a number of years where they looked at the nature of ZDDP, zinc dialkyl dithyl phosphate, which is in everybody's engine oils, and how do they work? What are the mechanisms of, of, of their applications? So it's a, been a very powerful tool for them. Next. Just to get, I just want to touch on a couple examples really quickly. This is the ZDDP films. I'm not going to really touch on this, but things like catalytic converters. A lot of people have done some research, you know, looking at different things, what what happens actually in a catalytic converter when it actually runs, um, and how can you improve the efficiency of those those um, converters? If I can get the next slide, it'd be great. I just want to show a couple quick examples. I I, I pulled off the off the web and from a colleague of mine um, in, in Europe, where he's looking at molybdenum different types of molybdenum, mixed molybdenum oxides, where we actually use a synchrotron as a very good fingerprinting tool to actually 
start differentiating the, kind of the makeup of these, everything from ML, um, aluminum dioxide and aluminum trioxide and all these mixed oxides in between, where he was actually able to use definitive lines in here to actually generate a calibration curve like any good analytical chemist would do. I'm a good physical chemist, and I, if I can't fit a straight line to something, I get really mad. Um, but now you've got this nice calibration curve here, and you can actually look at the peak positions to actually start dif differentiating what is the chemistry of my molybdenum, these mixed molybdenum oxides. We're doing something similar we're looking at nickel and fly ash, where we've actually been able to use that to differentiate, to actually quantify how much nickel oxide, nickel sulfate are in, the, in these fly ashes by actually generating a very similar calibration curve for, for environmental research. Next. Um, we talked about in situ time resolved experiments. This is an experiment where they actually took this uh, molybdenum trioxide, actually dumped hydrogen into it as a function of and they actually watch the change back to molybdenum dioxide at various temperatures. You can actually fit this out and actually, to get a good fit for the data set, you actually have to fit a mixed molybdenum oxide actually in that, that chemical process, actually as you put hydrogen in there as it goes from molybdenum trioxide back to molybdenum dioxide. You can also look at the change in the structure of the materials as well. Um, here's a case in which they had about 50% hydrogen in here, and as they cranked up the temperature, it was a phase transition from molybdenum, uh, from molybdenum trioxide to molybdenum dioxide, and you can actually see the change in the crystal structure of the two materials as um, this phase transition goes on. Next. Or here's another example here where they have vanadium metal, uh, had vanadium, and they could actually see the reduction of it and actually watch the reduction of the vanadium metal, the, watch the reduction of the vanadium um, in, hydro, in hydrogen at 500 degrees C. If this peak disappeared, which is characteristic of um, a higher oxidation state down back down to the vanadium metal. Yes. Just a couple last quick examples. Um, we're going to move away from catalysts real quick, just for fun. Uh, these are a couple examples in the archaeological, so it's just not phys physical chemistry, not the physics and chemistry and engineering that, that play in this area. Here in archaeology, there was a lot of work done actually at the University of Calgary in chemistry looking at the corrosion of nails in this uh, warship from Sweden. Uh, called the, the Vasa, the Swedish warship, and apparently it had one of the shortest voyages on history at some port, um, went about a thousand feet and then sunk. But this has actually been, was um, put on display in uh, a museum, and they found after a very rainy summer that the nails were starting to rust, they're getting all these various precipitates on the outside, they're actually able to use the synchrotron to understand what was going on due to the bacteria in that related to sulfur chemistry. Uh, you can also use the synchrotron to look at forgeries, uh, and what, what's going on in various types of um, materials for forgeries, or even look at ancient cosmetics without actually not opening the jars, but actually shining the synchrotron light through it. Chocolate. Um, this is actually an interesting example. Uh, this, is, this is a slide from ESRF, but Darsbury in the UK actually did an interesting experiment for, for Cadbury. Cadbury is having a problem with the processing. There's a particular structural form of chocolate which gives chocolate that nice soft texture you like so much. Um, but Cadbury was having a problem in that they weren't getting the right, it wasn't coming out right. And there's various structural forms, and there's a, call, a structural form called Form 5 chocolate. And if you don't do it at the right temperature, you don't get the Form 5 chocolate. And they also discovered that it proved what everybody's grandmother already knew, was that to actually get the right structural form, you actually have to stir or shear the chocolate as you melt it, or you don't get this right structural form. If you don't get the right structural form, you don't get the that sweetness or that right character. Well, the fun thing there too was they also showed Cadbury. Cadbury will never tell anybody how much money they saved. They could actually decrease their processing temperature by 15 degrees centigrade. And all the engineers in here would probably say, well, that's great, wonderful. So Cadbury was able to save a lot of money because they actually could process everything at lower temperatures. Next. So really the synchrotron, the use of the synchrotron light is as limitless, limitless as your imagination is. Because you need to shine light on something, it's a new way to look at it. So it's really kind of a fun way to look at it. So, but why is the synchrotron really here? I talked about that, and this is just to kind of tie things up and everybody can run down and jump on the bus. Um, is why is the synchrotron really in Saskatoon? And I'll give you a bit of a sense of that. Why is that? Um, if I can get the, just hit the button. This is an ad from about the time the university was formed. And I just want to read it because I thought this was kind of interesting. The governors decided on Saskatoon for the university because of the Saskatoon steam laundry could provide as no other place could the students and future great men with clean clothes. This is so essential a factor in the upbuilding of manhood and the developing of good citizenship that it provided to the point which hastened the decision. 
Let students come, our plant and facilities guarantee clean clothes and clean linen. So that's why the University of Saskatchewan, AKA, AKA the Canadian Light Source, is actually in Saskatoon, is because we have the cleanest clothes in town. <laughs> so with that, I will say thank you very much for whoever is coming over for the tour. Uh, we'll be happy to answer lots and lots of questions there. Thanks.